So this is kind of some of the basic stuff about how do you get over some of the initial uh, newness and sort of changing, you know, changing reflexes that are kind of embedded in your cerebellum. Because when you're one of, one of my mentors in training, um, when when he was, you know, we, we would say if you do a case with a fellow, and I was a fellow at the time, that if you're the attending, you need Dramamine, like panning the table, and let it go all over. The, and uh, he said to me at some point, because I'd always say, well, do I need to move this way or that? How do I remember? And he'd say, you just have to learn it. And sooner or later, it'll just get embedded in this part of your brain. And then you'll be able to do it. And I think that was one of my challenges with radial. I started doing radials around 2009 or 2010. And it's just kind of changing what's familiar. And you have to learn there's a new series of things that are just a little different about doing radial. Um, but from a career standpoint and everything, it's actually really invigorating when you, you learn a new way to do something. Uh, when you find how much your patients prefer this over femoral, you're going to be, uh, you know, really rewarded by that. So um, I, I, my, my latest sort of leap in the last year, and it shouldn't have taken me this long, but as the data continued to accumulate about STEMI, um, STEMI was the one environment where I used to feel like I'm still not completely comfortable because how long is it going to take to get access and you know what if the catheter doesn't fit right. But I've started doing um, STEMI's radial and it's remarkable. I mean you see in your patients how dramatically they feel better and to then go up to their room after the procedure and they're sitting up in bed talking with their family and you know they don't have a catheter in and they're not having back pain and they're not you know feeling so it's uh, so it's a stepwise process you know and you need to kind of give yourself some time to get used to it um, Ian Gilcrest was uh, kind enough to share some slides with me to help with this presentation um, so if you look at access issues and challenges there you know there are just different challenges if you come femoral and most of us kind of learned all the femoral challenges during our, during our training, finding the pulse, getting access, trying to make sure you're in the common femoral artery, hopefully not too high, not too low, uh, dealing with iliofemoral tortuosity in your route to, to get up to the heart, uh, sometimes dealing with aortic uh, issues, uh, big uncoiled arches and things like that. Um, and, and so there are some different challenges that come up with the radial. One of the biggest ones is really just around access. So you need to take your time. And, and getting access may be, uh, can often be the most challenging part of the procedure, but you, you get better and better at it. Um, so and then you know there are inherent, uh, one of the things that we encounter is there's tortuosity and curvature in the, in the great vessels. And uh, I will say, as people get older, you know, you will see more of this. So you'll see the so-called Z curves in the brachiocephalic and the right subclavian, where they've got a, a completely kind of tortuous uh, Z or S curve as you come up through here from the right radial. You can see issues with, uh, with the left subclavian as well. So, um, and then people have different kinds of uh, arches. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. In terms of where you might encounter resistance or, or problems, again, at, at the near the junction of the subclavian or the bifurcation of the brachiocephalic into the into the right common and the right subclavian, there may be tortuosity there. There there may be plaque there. Uh, there may be curvature. Uh, I always try to be really careful around here as you're going by the right carotid because that's where you can shave off uh, potentially something and send it up to the uh, up to the carotid and, and have issues with uh, uh, stroke. Uh, and then a second area of some as you enter uh, into the aorta, uh, and that's certainly from the left side another issue. So um, the only time you can get into the descending aorta is when you don't want to be there. So <laughs> when you come left radial, occasionally your, your catheter or wire will want to go down the descending aorta. Um, the things that tend to help with that, just having the patient take a deep breath, uh, will oftentimes direct your catheter to where you want to go, to the ascending aorta. And then um, the other thing is just uh, pulling the wire back and just reorienting the catheter to, to, so that the tip points uh, in the direction where you want to be. So, um, And again, one thing I will say, kind of the area where you encounter resistance 
is similar with the left radial approach, uh, a similar sort of location to what you find coming femoral. And again, for those of us who kind of grew up on femoral access, um, seems like the left subclavian, the left radial and subclavian approach is more analogous to that than, than coming from the right. And I think that may explain the proclivity for left radial here, uh, at least Jeff and I are, you know, and I think John's mixed, uh, maybe a little more right radial than left, but, but, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> It's not good for your back and your shoulders, yeah, yeah. Um, and then aortic root variations. This is actually important and, um, you know, it's, it's there in everybody, but you, you don't notice this as much when you come femoral. So as people get older, when people are younger, the orientation of their coronaries and the root tends to be like this sort of. The left coronary a little higher than the right, and usually at about, if it was a clock face, that's about 2 or 3 o'clock. And the right coronary at about 8 or 9 o'clock. Um, but as people age and their arch changes, the coronaries tend to take more of a north-south orientation. And I think we easily correct for that from the femoral by usually just using a longer catheter uh, to reach the left. Uh, uh, but this can present some challenges when you're learning radial. Um, and you do need to be really careful in these folks that have these different configurations that you manipulate your, especially your right coronary catheter gently and easily because um, all of us in our early experience with this have seen a, a catheter just jet, jettison its way down the right coronary artery and go, you know, almost halfway down the, the artery. And that's, that's a, an experience, um, especially if it, you know, causes a, a big dissection. So, um, so just, again, it's kind of like going back and, and learning again. So just taking it a little bit slower um, and trying different things. So right or left radial, again, these are kind of the, the options and the, and the challenges. Um, as far as single catheter or multiple, Mason Soans was the first cardiologist, he actually disco in, incidentally discovered coronary angiography. So he was a pediatric cardiologist at the Cleveland Clinic doing uh, pediatrics. You can see this is kind of a small pediatric patient. But he was doing ventriculograms on uh, patients with a single, like a multipurpose type. Or, and now he had his own catheter named after him, the Soans catheter, which when he pulled back out of the ventricle went into, I think, the left coronary. And that's how coronary. And, as they were power injecting, and he saw a left coronary angiogram and said, this is pretty neat. Um, so Soans was the first proponent of a, of a single catheter approach. And many of you in the room uh, who trained or, or maybe even personally lived in the era where a lot of cardiologists would do an entire case with a single catheter, usually a multipurpose type catheter, uh, from the femoral, uh, oftentimes with no sheath. So. There were a handful of people still doing that when I was training. Um, if you look at sheath size, um, it, again, this is so. This is looking at the U.S. versus the uh, U.S. is in orange and non-U.S. in blue. Four, five, or six French. Um, we now have uh, several options around that. So the slender sheath is like a five French sheath with a six French type diameter. Uh, so many of us like to use that for diagnostic because it's, it, it behaves like a five French sheath in terms of the outer diameter, but the inner diameter will accommodate a six French guide. So you can put a slender sheath in, do your procedure, go on if you need to to intervention uh, without, cha without changing sheaths. Um, so, um, but again, some docs really uh, prefer to use the four French um, catheter uh, sheath size, um, perhaps smaller patients. Women tend to have smaller radial arteries than men. So if you've got a smaller size patient and you want to reduce your risk of uh, spasm or radial occlusion, you might be considering a four French. Personally, I've had some troubles opacifying the coronary arteries acceptably using four French catheters, but a lot of people can, can do it. So that is an option. Uh, this, again, sort of speaks to what I talked about, looking at the frequency curves of, of radial diameters in men versus women and how that relates to sheath size. 
So preference clearly uh, in both the US and outside the US, the majority of operators prefer the right radial. So, um, and that probably reflects people are pretty much used to standing on the right side of the table, having the access equipment close to them. And that's how most people learn. So um, doing any type of testing beforehand to assess collateral circulation, there's a lot of people that say that, that this is a complete waste of time. Um, I, I don't know that I fully agree with that. But the reality is, there, um, I believe it was Barbeau and his group that published that only the patients with the absolutely completely abnormal um, test where you see no connection whatsoever, uh, whether you're doing it by plethysmography, uh, the Allen's test isn't going to really, it's more of a crude assessment of just looking at the, the blush and, and looking at the uh, filling. Um, but, but there are, uh, they, they did a study in several thousand patients where they basically said you could safely do radial access on most patients that had an abnormal Allen's test as long as they didn't have the complete lack of any contribution of the ulnar to their circulation. So, um, but a number of operators really don't pay much attention to this and, and don't, don't bother doing it. And, and the, the reason that people say that is there's this the, the potential uh, collateral circulation um, that's, that's you know, pretty robust and can develop if an occlusion uh, uh, develops of the radial. So um, you, you'll have to decide uh, if you want to do it. Um, most of the patients I still do an Allen's test on um, because it makes me feel better. But uh, I'm not sure if that's, you know. And again, the ones that I will not do radial access on is if it, it looks complete. I mean, there's just no, no fill in at all. Not a delayed, but just nothing. In, until you release the radial. What about catheters? I think what this sort of slide, and there's new ones that come out, taught me is that you can pick whatever you want uh, as far as catheters. So you don't have to use a specialty curve to do radials. You can if you want. Um, and many people uh, start out using Tigers and Jackies and Sarahs and other type radial catheters with the idea in mind that they could do the whole case with one catheter um, and have pretty good success with that. And then a lot of operators have done that, but then end up moving back to the equipment they're familiar with. So uh, for the left coronary, more often than not, a Judkins 3.5 is, is, uh, is what works, or sometimes a 4. Um, and so it ends up that after a lot of sort of moving around, people, a lot of people end up just using uh, uh, these catheters. And certainly our colleagues outside the United States who have more experience, have been doing this longer than we have, have, have mostly moved back to the traditional curves. For the right coronary, it's kind of the same, same story. One of the things that I found, and again, I, don't, I didn't try it for a long time, but using the specialty curve catheters Usually, if it, if it fit well in the right, it didn't reach the left. Or if it went deep in the right, then it would reach the left. But I never quite felt like I was really getting what I wanted from a single catheter. Um, so, um, And I think the other thing is uh, I may have been sort of trying to change too much at once. So I was learning radial, learning access, learning the anatomy, and then trying to use a new catheter that I was unfamiliar with. And I would say maybe in the beginning, you limit the number of things that are, that are different to you. So learn the technique first using equipment that you're more comfortable with. Um, and then later on, you might decide you want to try the specialty curves and, and, and once you're kind of more comfortable with the, with the uh, lay of the land. So this shows some of the different catheters that can be used. Um, I'm not sure why the, it's funny the Jackie didn't show up on there. So. Um, this shows the technique of getting access to the right coronary um, coming from the right radial. Um, and, and again, the things that some of us have learned here is just, uh, and it's sort of like what you teach fellows when they're first you know, learning, make smaller movements. Uh, there's a, there can be built up torque in the catheter, and so you, you don't want to make uh, sort of dramatic movements, because then it can 
just dive its way down the right corner. Um, this is the, one of the techniques for going into the left coronary uh, with the left Judkins coming from, from the right um, and coming from uh, the left. And one of the things that I've found most, when you come from the left radial, your wire and most of your equipment typically wants to go into the right coronary cusp. So, so a lot of times when we're doing exchanges, uh, again, typically we'll do the right coronary first and then do the left. And, and, and I know Jeff does this a fair amount. I'll park my wire right here in the cusp, bring the left Judkins down. This is kind of different than what you were taught in training. Um, and then slowly remove the wire while you're pulling back. Um, so you start underneath where the coronary is and you're in the other cusp. But as you remove the wire and slowly retract the catheter, and it's usually a counterclockwise torque, um, it will oftentimes go engage right into the left coronary. And you have to be a little careful about doing that. So you, you tell your tech, don't you know, pull the wire out like this because then the catheter can suddenly you know, jump into the left main and dissect. And so it's a little bit different, that technique, than what we were taught in training, which was to sort of come from from above and work your way uh, into the ostium. So uh, this is a very rare variant, but something you should be aware of. There's a small number of people where the, uh, the right subclavian artery comes off the descending aorta and goes behind the esophagus. And so if you're coming from the, um, from the right radial, you'll see your catheter start to look like it's heading down towards the descending aorta. And, and that makes it almost impossible from here to then get back around here and, and uh, to engage the. So, so in that sort of scenario, if you see it, it's one in a 1,000, so you might not. Um, but that would be one where you'd want to switch to the left radial. Um, and then interventional catheters, uh, these are some of the different ones that are used. Again, these tend to run along the lines of what people use um, for coronary intervention. I have found sometimes if you're having a challenging, uh, oftentimes the vessel that's harder to engage, at least from the left radial, is the left coronary. And so you try a couple of different catheters. And oftentimes if you just use a guiding catheter uh, as a diagnostic, it, it will pretty easily just uh, engage if you're having trouble with your diagnostic catheter. So either like an XB35 or a, a left, uh, a left uh, coronary guiding catheter. Um, and then uh, for the right coronary, it's still um, a fair amount of Judkins right. There are a fair number of people that like to use a right or left amplats with the right, especially if they're going to be working distally or there's tortuosity and they want more guiding support. And then a lot of people will use, um, for complex stuff downstream, a guideliner type option, guidezilla or guideliner, the guide within a guide, to, to give you better uh, uh, options for delivery or dealing with complex anatomy. And then finally, the, kind of one of the latest developments in our intervention options are the sheathless guides. And the concept behind these is that you're actually using a, a guiding catheter without a sheath. Um, and because of that, you, you end up with uh, a much larger internal diameter to allow you to do procedures. So you have a 6.5 French option and a 7.5 French. Um, but the, the actual size of these in terms of the, uh, the outer diameter is, is similar to the sheaths that we use for access. So, uh, but it allows you to deliver larger equipment. It would give you options to do rotablator or bifurcation if you're going to need to do two balloons or that sort of thing. Um, so this is, what, this is what they look like. Um, important for these is they come with a dilator, and the dilator has to be in during insertion. Um, and then when you get to the level of the ascending aorta, the, the dilator uh, and wire are removed to allow the catheter to assume its uh, shape. And these are some of the different uh, curves. So there, and again, this catheter, when it's in the body, is not going to look like this. It's going to take a shape that's more like that. So there's a JL, AL, JR, 
Um, this SC is kind of like a C curve, basically, hockey stick. Power backup, which is similar to the EBU or XB. Um, and then the, um, I think this one's the super power backup. So, um, so these are, are new options that you have. What you end up getting from this is a much bigger uh, inner diameter to work with. And so you can see that, um, for example, you would be able to fit a 1.75 burr in the 6.5 French sheathless guide and a 2.0 burr in the 7.5 French sheathless guide. Um, it gives you a little bit more in the way of options. So um, skip that part. This is just talking about you know, how, do you, how do you put it in. You use the dilator. Uh, the TUI adapter hooks right up to the hub of, the, uh, of your sheathless guide. Um, and then when you remove it, it's recommended that you go ahead and um, put the dilator back in, pull the catheter uh, back uh, into the uh, right or left side, and then actually remove um, the, the guide wire is um, removed first. And then the whole system is taken out just like you would remove the sheath and use your TR band. Um, so some suggestions just for those of you getting started. I really do think it's better to just start out with familiar catheters first, get your technique down, and then consider using specialty catheters. I don't think you need to be, don't let the broad spectrum of choices make you feel overwhelmed, like I don't want to do this because I have to learn all these new catheters and, and so forth. Again, if you can get your technique down, then you can just use the catheter choices as, as an option. Um, if you're trying to do a diagnostic procedure and your standard catheters aren't working, um, oftentimes, rather than going through multiple uh, diagnostic catheters, a guiding catheter uh, for the left will actually oftentimes do it. And most often, if you're having trouble, an Amplatz catheter for the right um, uh, can be the way to go, and possibly even for the left. Mm -hmm.